I was waiting for somebody to do that. That's a song we want to clap to, Be Thou My Vision. Great song, great hymn. For those uh, in your teenage years right now, Brooklyn, Jimmy, Kinsey, you guys uh, don't have much awareness, if any, of Billy Graham, probably not even your mom and dad. Um, I, you got to be probably 40, 45, 50 for the impact of Billy Graham's life to really have touched you. But for those in my generation, we grew up hearing about Billy Graham, seeing him on television, and for those of us who were fortunate enough to be able to go to one of his crusades and attend live and in person. More people heard Billy Graham preach live and in person than any other person that's ever lived. There's no firm numbers, obviously, but it's in the scores of millions of people. He had crusades, preaching series, for 60 years in 185 countries. I was able as a child to go hear him uh, at Louisville at a crusade when I was probably in my early teen years. Heard him again when I was in seminary in Lexington. And then the two crusades he did in Cincinnati in 1977 and 2002, I was able to be a part of the counseling team that help people who came forward to make decisions. Billy Graham is one of those people who stand out for a whole generation, for a whole century. It's kind of like Billy Graham, Mother Teresa, Pope John Paul, stand out for the 20th century. Bob Dylan, that noted uh, theologian, said, when I was growing up, Billy Graham was very popular. He was the greatest preacher and evangelist of my time. That guy could save souls, and he did. I went to two or three of his rallies in the 50s or 60s. This guy was like rock and roll personified. He filled the stadiums. When he spoke, he brought the storm down. Clouds parted. Souls got saved. Sometimes 30 to 40,000 people at a crusade. If you ever went to a Billy Graham rally back then, you were changed forever. That's what we're talking about. In remembering Billy Graham, people keep coming back to his humility, to his care for people, to his integrity. One of his five children, Ned, noted that his famous father's propensity for making his children feel important was one of the things that impacted his life. And Ned remembered a time when he was a young boy, and Billy Graham was talking on the phone to President Lyndon Johnson there at their home. And Ned walked into his father's bedroom, and his dad said, Just a moment, Lyndon. And Dr. Graham then put the phone on his chest and motioned for Ned to come on in. And Ned said, To me, that said that I was more important to him than the President of the United States. The late Martin Luther King Jr. experienced Billy Graham's friendship during the fight for civil rights. He said, had it not been for the ministry of my good friend, Dr. Billy Graham, my work in the civil rights movement would not have been as successful as it has been. Billy Graham took a stand against segregation in the South. He would not speak any place that had a segregated audience. President Obama said, this of Dr. Graham's death. Billy Graham was a humble servant who prayed for so many and who with wisdom and grace gave hope and guidance to generations of Americans. President Jimmy Carter tirelessly spreading a message of fellowship and hope. Billy Graham shaped the spiritual lives of tens of millions of people worldwide. Broad-minded forgiving and humble in his treatment of others, he exemplified the life of Jesus Christ by constantly reaching out for opportunities to serve. He spoke to the powerful, 
He spent the night in the White House, the last night of President Lyndon's presidency, and stayed the next night for the first evening of President Nixon's. But he was also the friend of the everyday person. He had a heart to see every person have a chance to hear the gospel and respond to it and, and make that life-changing choice to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Of the thousands, Billy Graham's preaching led to Christ. One is very special to those of us here at Grace Church. You've probably heard Pastor Grace tell about her testimony. In her early 20s, Billy Graham was on the TV. She heard his message, and it touched her heart in a way that she had never experienced God before. And she made that decision and the commitment, and it's brought her to be the beloved pastor that she is for us now. I say all that because as Grace expressed just a few moments ago, we see Billy Graham now as a part of that great cloud of witnesses that is cheering us on, encouraging us to run the race that is set before us. Listen again to the passage of Scripture we've been looking at the past couple weeks. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. And we'll be reading it from the message version, which puts it in a little bit different vernacular than the NIV. It says, do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blazed the way, all these veterans cheering us on, that's his description of the great cloud of witnesses. It means that we better get on with it, strip down, start running, and never quit. No spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way. Cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor, right alongside God. When you find yourselves flagging in your faith, go over that story again, item by item, that long litany of hostility that he plowed through, that will shoot adrenaline into your souls. Would you pause to pray with me for a moment? God, as we think about this challenge, as we think about your word, may it touch our hearts. May we be open to it. May we be saying yes. May we be yielded and expectant and still before you in, this, in these moments. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Pastor Grace said it out for us last week when she said, we're, as we talk about running this race, we must first come to it with some intentionality. We must determine that we are going to run this race on your mark. And then we must focus on what the race is, where the goal is, where the finish is, and strive towards it. We must get set. And then, of course, we run the course. We run the race. We go. On your mark, get set, go. Pastor Grace talked to us last week about the intentionality of making that decision, that commitment, I am going to follow Christ and I am going to live my life in the way that he calls me to and that shows me to I'm going to run that race Ed Stetzer a writer and professor at Wheaton College said this about Billy Graham he said Billy Graham was an amazing model for the Christian faith a person whose mind and heart get this were fixated upon Jesus they were fixated his mind and heart were fixated upon Jesus. That is the focus that we need. That's the focus where it belongs. And that's what we're talking about today. today. On your mark, get set, get focused. Here's how the Apostle Paul talks about it in his own life. 
In the book of Philippians, he's been talking about what it means to be a follower of Christ. And the, the, the call that it takes all of us, our full commitment to strive towards that maturity as a, as a mature follower of Jesus to the stature of Christ. And here's what he says. He says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. I focus on this one thing. What is it? It's running the race, getting to the finish line, having lived our life faithfully in Christ and for Christ. Pastor Grace last week said this. She says, winning is not beating the other runners. No, we're not competing against each other. The prize is becoming a spiritual champion. A spiritual champion is one sold out to Jesus, straining to become more like him every day. The finish line of faith, she said, is a life that is more Christian today than it was yesterday. Are you making progress? The danger of living with the wrong focus is also addressed by the Apostle Paul. He says this in the same passage here in Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 and 19. He says, brothers and sisters, become imitators of me and watch those who live this way. You can use us as models. You know, it takes a lot of um, integrity of life to be able to say to someone, follow me. The Apostle Paul could do that. Billy Graham could do that. So Paul says, use us as models. He says, as I have told you many times, and now say with deep sadness, many people live as enemies of the cross. How do they do that? Their lives end with destruction. Their God is their stomach, and they take pride in their disgrace because their thoughts focus on earthly things. Now, he's using the metaphor there, figure of speech. The, 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 their, uh, go, God is their stomach. Now, for some of us, maybe food is uh, kind of our, our, our pitfall, our shortcoming. But it's whatever it is materially that we put our desires upon and we, we think is going to satisfy the longings and the needs of our life. There is nothing in this world that can satisfy the deepest longing that is at the heart of the human soul. Only God can feel that. And so Paul warns us, don't put your focus on earthly things. Billy Graham said at one time, anxiety is the natural result when our hopes are centered on anything short of God and his will for us. That's what makes us anxious in life. We're looking for meaning in all the wrong places. And so we are called to focus on the things that really matter. And here's how Paul describes these in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, we don't focus on the things that can be seen, material things, status, prestige, place in life that is prominent. We don't focus on the things that can be seen, but on the things that can't be seen. The things that can be seen don't last, but the things that can't be seen are eternal. Philippians 4, 8 says, From now on, brothers and sisters, if anything is excellent and if anything is admirable, focus your thoughts on these things. Help me with this. All that is what? All that is what? All that is? All that is? All that is? And all that is worthy of praise. Those are the things to focus our hearts, our minds, our lives upon. 
Finally, in this passage from Philippians chapter 3, Paul urges us. He says, so let's keep focused on that goal. Those of us who want everything God has for us, keep focused on that goal. If, you, if any of you have something else in mind, something less than total commitment, God will clear your blurred vision. You'll see it yet. Now that we're on the right track, let's stay on it. Let's get in the race. Let's get focused, keeping our eyes on the goal, and then stay on that track. Now, Billy Graham challenges us in the video that we watched to take on three things every day to help us maintain that focus. Because... Let's be honest, it's very easy to get distracted. Life is busy. There are demands. We, we are engaged daily in activities and work and interactions with people. But Jesus was just as well, and he was able to keep his eyes on, his, on the goal. Paul was just as well. Here's what Billy Graham says that we are to do to maintain proper focus. First, do everything we can to follow in the steps of Jesus, to live a life in which we love one another, we help one another, and we live according to what Jesus lived. All that by the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, he says each day, make it our determination as we get out of bed to say, I'm living for you today, Christ. I'm going to love the people around me as you would love them. My family, the people I work with, the people I go to school with. I'm going to love them. I'm going to care for them. I'm going to show your character and your nature in my life. That's the first step. The secondly, second thing Billy Graham says is that, that we are to be people of God's word, of, of the Bible. He says to read it every day. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but how many of us read it every day? He says read it every day. Make the Bible your source and authority. Quote it frequently. Let its message be your message study it, meditate upon it, memorize it, trust its promises. The word of God itself has power. In his later years, Billy Graham suffered a, a, a number of physical ailments that, that uh, limited, his, lim limited his activity. Uh, he had Parkinson's. He, he couldn't get around very well anymore. And he couldn't see very good. He couldn't read the Bible as much as he did earlier. But he talked about having it memorized. If we spend time in God's word every day, eventually you know where God's word gets? Gets in here. Gets in here. You know, I, I talk about my mom all the time. She's 91. She can't remember. I talked to her yesterday. She probably didn't, thinks I haven't talked to her in a week. But you know what she doesn't forget? She, she knows scripture. She can quote it. She walks around uh, in the retirement community where she lives, and she quotes the Psalms, and she quotes passages from the Gospels. What, how, what a treasure it is when we get the Word of God inside us. To do that, Billy Graham says, we need to focus on it. Take some in every day. Thirdly, he says, go to your knees and pray until you and God have become intimate friends. I cannot describe to you, he says, the joy and the peace that God gives to you as a result of that daily routine that you have in prayer. So Billy, Billy Graham says, the key, and this is, this is what he practiced, to maintain focus in your life, to run this race, is to, turn, to determine each day that you're going to live in the honor of Jesus, treat people the way that Jesus would, and do the things Jesus would Stay in God's word every day. Uh, have conversation with God throughout the day in prayer. It doesn't mean that you have to close your eyes and bow your head. You can be doing driving. Uh, you, you can be working and praying. Friday at the Work is Worship retreat here, uh, the first speaker that we heard challenged us to take on some daily practices to keep our focus on the main thing. Matt Chandler was the speaker. He's a pastor of a large church in Dallas. And he described some of his personal daily routine. He said he, he, he determined that he would make his time driving to work, 
two appointments, two meetings, two uh, uh, make pastoral calls. He would make his drive time purpose, purposeful and help to keep things in focus by using that time to think of the day, to think of the next meeting, to think of, of the next encounter and prepare himself for it by engaging in prayer conversation as he drives. We can all do that. Another thing Matt Chandler says is part of his daily routine is he makes sure that he puts buffers in between the various things that uh, are on his schedule for that day. If he has several meetings, he wants a 10 minute buffer in between each meeting. If he has appointments coming in, he wants a 10 minute interval. Why? So that he can refocus, that he can set aside the meeting he's just been in, he can prepare for the next appointment. He wants 10 minutes to refocus his heart on God in prayer. And then thirdly, he says at the end of the day when he heads home, when he pulls into the driveway, he turns off the car and he sits in the car for another 30 to 40 seconds just preparing his heart and spirit to go in now and be a husband, to be a father, to engage with his family, set aside the things that have happened during the day, set aside his own tiredness and needs maybe to just unwind. He prays that God will help him go in and be that husband and father he is meant to be. Now that's Matt Chandler's practice. I like that. Um, I'm going to try to put some of those things into practice, but you can find your own um, rhythm, the, the practices that will fit your life and your lifestyle. But the key is we have to keep our focus. We lose focus when we don't stay engaged with God, when we don't stay immersed in his word. Finally, here's how Jesus said to maintain our focus. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, how often? Daily, he says. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. In other words, Jesus is saying, every day we need to reset our focus on him putting ourself subordinate to his will we are all works in progress but hopefully we are making progress hopefully we are striving to run the race daily with perseverance with intentionality with focus Billy Graham's wife Ruth herself was an inspiration she grew up the daughter of missionaries in China for the first 17 years of her life and she was sensing God's call in her own heart to be a missionary she was prepared to do that that was her life dream and then she met Billy Graham at college and as uh their romance grew and it looked like it was heading towards marriage she knew she would need to make a decision to follow what had been her heart's dream to be on the mission field or to be the wife of an evangelist who was going to be in demand all around the world her children uh say there would not be any Billy Graham if it were not for Ruth Graham and here's what she said as she uh, thought about the end of her life she passed away 11 years ago you, you've heard the saying please be patient with me God isn't finished with me yet here's what Ruth Graham had put on her uh, gravestone marker on it it says end of construction Thank you for your patience. End of construction. She's gone on to glory to be with the Lord where all of us will be perfected one day. In the video, Billy Graham says that he has been praying that we would have a spiritual awakening across our land. 
That is something we should all be praying for. Lord knows we need it. And he says, but I think that becomes possible only as individuals surrender their lives afresh and anew to Christ and live the Christian life wherever you are. Listen once again to his challenge as we close. I've been praying that we might have a spiritual awakening, but I think that becomes possible only as individuals surrender their lives afresh and anew to Christ and live the Christian life wherever you are. Is there a lack of power in your life? Perhaps you have neglected the preparation of your life. We've neglected prayer. We've neglected God's word and the feeding of our own souls. Whatever it is, confess it, forsake it, repent of it, and then walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and gain victory over it. And may God today lift our vision and may the power of the gospel break upon our world with fresh force as we are obedient to Christ's call to repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. Would you stand, please? Jesus said, if you would be my disciple, you must deny yourself and take, your, take up your cross daily and follow me. Dr. Graham just challenged us to renew and refresh our commitment to, to Jesus each and every day. We're here this morning in worship. I would give you this opportunity to set your focus firmly on Christ. If he is who you are living for, would you say that this morning by stepping forward and coming up here and just touching the front of the platform or standing here in prayer? We got the cross there. You can come to the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, I want to live my life for you. I invite you to do that as the band just plays softly. This is a time for you to affirm your focus. Would you do it now? If you want to surrender your life to Jesus today for the first time, come forward. If you would just want to renew a commitment that you've made many times, come forward. It's just a way of saying, I'm here. I'm running the race. Help me by your spirit. in singing the last the closing song you can still come as we sing 